The first question that we have is, the movie was extraordinary. Is it available to share with other groups? If so, could you tell us how to access it? Probably on Monday or Tuesday, it will be posted, the entire conference will be posted on Our Lady of Lourdes Parish website and also on the Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis website. So you'll be able to access it there and share it. And we will probably, uh, just one clarification, you will probably be able to access it even today. Uh, Julie Craven will work at getting the film uh, up on our uh, parish website. And if it's possible, we would uh, send a link to those who registered as well. We'll try to do that. But I think you'll be able to get it uh, up this afternoon. Hunter has said that the sound will be fine when the video is available on YouTube. Um, let's see. The next one is, um, this was said in the movie, I think, but I would like to say the following, and I'll just shorten it. The abusers did not act alone. A lot of times there are corrupt lay people in parish leadership, such as parish council members, trustees, administrators who not only ignored parish clergy abuse, but were condoning the clergy or religious, and many times knew full well what was going on, and did nothing, and also participated in the abuse along with the priest. And this has caused many parishes to be divided. I'm not sure there's a question here. I appreciate the comment. I, um, I do agree with the comment that that has taken place in parishes, not every parish, but in parishes where abuse has taken place. And uh, just, I remember there's a scene from uh, Spotlight, which is a powerful film, and two, two scenes really stand out. One is just the sadness of clergy abuse, where the, the mother of the journalist is reading in the Sunday paper about all the things that had happened. But to the, to the question, I agree, there, there, it was countenanced and complicit by a number of people. Uh, and somebody said, it, you know, it takes a, a village in that movie, they say it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a village to abuse a child. And um, there's that scene where he's trying to put pressure on the one fellow, the journalist, to back off and the guy responds by saying, so this is how it happens. Uh, this is how abuse happens. I don't know if Janine has any thoughts. No, I, I think that whole idea that around, around the perpetrator, there are ripples and there may be people who've been negatively impacted, but there are those who are complicit and um, often there are many others involved. And so it's all part of the need for healing is not just the individual. <clears throat> the next question, how hopeful are you that we as a society can truly transition to transformative justice given the current political environment? Will the church be the thought leader on this? Well, I'm hopeful um, some days. <laughs> some days I'm not. But I, you know, it has to be. I mean, it ha it's either we're leading to our destruction or we have to have hope. And I think, you know, when you deal individually with people or small groups or community, there's so much goodness in our country. And, I, you know, despite what I think have been abuses of our constitution and, and societal um, norms, I think there's going to be a lash backwards, a backlash forward, I will put it that way, where people are going to return and find the need for civil discourse, for collaboration, um, and, but it, it's going to take time, and I think all of us cannot sit back and be forlorn over what's happened, but need in our own way, in our own communities, our own neighborhoods, our own churches, our own places of business, to keep trying to try to get people reformed. I'm, I'm hearing lots of hope with people that are really doing some good things and reaching out more than they did before. Um, I am also hopeful um, and as Father Dan mentioned, it's going to be a long road that there'll be substantial reforms in the church. Um, I think that's the only way the church is going to continue. Um, and there's so much goodness in, in Catholic social teaching, 
in Pope Francis's words, and there are many, many people that are sticking it out uh, when even though they find that closed culture to be able to reform it and to find this as a place of hope and faith. And so I, I remain optimistic most of the time and I keep plugging away as all we all do. I would like to ask Father Dan to comment on La Crosse Bishop William Callahan's attempt of fraternal correction of Father James Altman, a priest of that diocese. At what point does one move beyond fraternal correction and how does one hear the story of James Altman in such a way to bring healing? Yeah, and um, I'll confess uh, not as much knowledge as I should have uh, with regard to that, um, that situation. I think that um, there have been situations where uh, bishops have, and th this has happened in our diocese recently as well, there was a homily given uh, a few months ago that was not thoughtfully done. And, um, and there was an attempt to, 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 to correct. Um, I think it has to uh, approach the lines of going to that person, entering into dialogue, making clear the, the teaching of the, of the church or, or the teachings of Christ. Um, and then how you get beyond to healing, well, that often is, has to be the openness of, of the person who needs, to, who needs to move to a place of greater light. And one of the things I think, you know, Paul and Janine and I see in this work is folks without unhealed wounds. So people, you know, whether it, was, it might be self-inflicted or, or those, you know, perpetrated upon them, what can happen is sometimes people go back into their woundedness rather than there's an invitation to move to a, to a higher plane. And, um, and that, that's one of the saddest things I've seen in pastoral ministry is when folks don't, you know, move. Uh, you know, Paula spoke eloquently about uh, those victim survivors who are in a place of despair, and understandably so, and to, to pray and to always be ready to accompany. Um, but I will get myself briefed on that. Um, I'm usually pretty in tune to what the things going on, but it's been a kind of an extraordinary couple of weeks trying to get started teaching. But I don't know if Janine knows that. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, maybe maybe the person could click a, a thing that just describes the nature of uh, what the issue was, and we can come back to it. But I, I applaud uh, if there was a. a, a a good effort at fraternal correction. What I would say, though, is the bishops need to, to step up and they need to be willing to fraternally correct uh, their brothers. Uh, that is an area of, of as Janine noted, needed uh, reform in the, in the Catholic Church. What training opportunities are there to gain more knowledge and experience in restorative justice? Well, they're becoming more common, um, and you really need to look in the area um, that you're um, living in. Um, I mean, there are opportunities through Catholic mobilizing. They, they have given a number of trainings. Um, a number of institutions have given training. And if you really don't know where to look, look at your, the closest universities and see whether there's a restorative justice program because the person that's running that, even if they aren't doing trainings, will know where the trainings are. Um, there's a whole gamut of training. Um, for example, in Milwaukee, we've had, our district attorney's office has been engaged in a restorative justice project for well over 20 years. And it's called community conferencing and they take um, low level felonies and some misdemeanors and they bring in trained community members, people from the neighborhoods, um, to be the community members and they also train facilitators and they offer those trainings in churches across, across the community and then they do um, restorative justice community conferencing with an offender who may be charged with a dr low level drug dealing case or other kinds of cases or some personal injury kinds of cases. Um, if you, you can look to churches, you can look to institutions, but it's it's slowly growing and um, they're out there. Um, and, you know, I think what you want in addition to the training is to get either start or get into some kind of network of support. 
because you can't, it's very difficult to just be out there on your own doing restorative justice work and not have people you can communicate with and learn from and be mentored from. Um, you know, if, if whoever wants, whoever's asking the question, if you want to send me an email at Marquette or send it to this, I'll take a look to see if I can find anything. I know that uh, the training that I received was through the Catholic Mobilizing Network out of Washington, D.C., and it was done with Father David Kelly in Chicago. Um, we have an update on Father Altman. He stated, and I remember reading this, um, Father Altman stated categorically that a Catholic cannot be a Democrat, period. Oh, yes. oh, the no. bishop started with private correction. Right. Now, now I recall, because one of our one of our parishioners uh, emailed me, a young parishioner, and uh, I told her that, uh, that we, I or the associate pastor would get back to her. Well, the, the bishops have been clear in their, in their pastoral, uh, their um, forming conscience for faithful citizenship, that you know, there's Catholics all over the political spectrum. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I commend uh, the bishop for the fraternal correction. Yeah. And of course, remember, I believe he, he's a priest in, in um, there's a priest in Wisconsin in La Crosse who issued that, and then another bishop backed him. I think a b bishop out of Texas. Um, you know, I, I just you listen to the greater voice, and I know that bish that Bishop Gregory, um, Archbishop Ger Gregory, spoke out on it and said this is wrong, and. Um, uh, you know, it's a human institution, even though it may be under God, and, and you're going to find these things. And I think, you know, it's my personal views are the church should just leave, the, leave it to the faith of the faithful to decide where they think um, a candidate best meets their own personal values and faith. Yeah, the great thing about Catholic social teaching is that it does form consciences, uh, and it transcends political ideology. Uh, and so I think that's a, that's a helpful thing, but it can be challenging as Catholics to, to vote. One of the things that I have always um, said in the classes that I've taught in parishes is that there are good Catholics on both sides of this issue. There's good Catholics who are Democrats, there's good Catholics who are Republicans. If you're voting according to your conscience, and we can't sit in judgment on someone who has voted according to their conscience. Okay. Um, I reported scandal in my diocese, and because I worked for the diocese, I was forced to submit to a psychological assessment. The psychologist found nothing wrong with me and told me she was ordered to diagnose me with something, so in order to keep my job, I was forced to sign a false diagnosis that I had post-traumatic stress disorder so that nobody would believe my testimony. What can people in this situation do? You know, I think that um, what, what you would want to uh, attempt to do is to report that to an appropriate uh, ecclesial authority. The, depending on where it came from, there are usually, there should be diocesan guidelines. Uh, one of the challenges we see in the United States is the lack of any uniformity with regard to standards of conduct, with regard to what constitutes a credible allegation. And this is really, it's a, it's a challenging reality. Uh, vos estis with regard to bishops uh, is, is fairly wide-ranging in terms of, of, of their uh, conduct. Uh, we'll see if it is applied concretely uh, and followed up on, but um, you, you would want to check diocesan guidelines. I think diocesan offices uh, and authorities would be good to have something like an ombudsman person role that not only deals with clergy abuse, but, uh, you know, larger issues of justice and, and, um, and the like. And so uh, I'm sorry that that happened to you. And, um, you know, those things have, we've heard stories about those things happening in far too many places. And it, and it, and it evidences a culture that needs to be transformed. 
but I would check with diocesan, and if there's somebody you trust in, in leadership in your particular diocese. The other part of me, and of course, I, I, this is the legal half of me, I, I, don't, I would consult if you could find a, a labor lawyer who'd be willing to talk to you about that. I mean, it's a serious thing to admit that you have a mental health issue when you don't. Um, and the fact that there was some kind of psychologist that was willing to certify that is another pro level of problems and complaints. Um, but I would encourage you not to let that lie. I think, you know, you don't need that on your record um, if it's not true. And um, so anyway, I would look to try to pursue it. I don't know whether you'll have any luck or not, but um, I think I would explore it a bit. Yeah, I would, I, I definitely would keep your voice being heard. You need to speak out about that. Um, I would suggest maybe going to a neighboring diocese and asking for advice there on what, if there's anything that they can do. Um, thank you all for your deep and meaningful work. Are your healing groups open to new participants? The groups for the victim survivors, yes, are open to new participants. You would just have to contact me Probably through the Archdiocesan website would be the best way. And you can just email me and let me know who you are and that you want to join the group. We do have two groups that I, I didn't distinguish during my presentation. One group is for those who have been abused, either as children or adults, um, by clergy or a clergy member or a Catholic employee. Um, and also others, you know, if you've been sexually abused, we welcome you. There's also another group that is started as well for those who were adults when they were abused by clergy. And the reason we have a separate group for them is that there is a different level of shame when it comes to adult being an adult when you were abused because people always say, well, why didn't you leave? Why didn't you get away? Why didn't you stop it? You had the power to stop it. And I think that shows um, a misunderstanding of what the grooming process is and how the perpetrator grooms the victim to be so dependent on them that they can't envision living without them. So they will do anything to keep this person in their life. So we do have um, a group just for those. So just contact me and let me know which group you would like to belong to. And real quick, Paul, one thing that might be helpful is for, you know, to possibly collaborate on the creation of a, of a group for those who have experienced secondary uh, harm. So either, okay, great. You know, the parents or, or uh, yes. members. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to be starting a group like that. So if you are interested, I certainly would love to hear from you. Um, how could one go about getting a family circle of members where secondary abuse has occurred um, through the victim and from the perpetrator? When family members abuse each other, there seems to be no one who will accept them in a support group, and the church doesn't realize how much this occurs. So yes, we will be starting those probably in the next two months as well. The story about clergy abuse being supported also drew on the division between liberal and conservative Catholics. I'd like to hear your thoughts about this schism and whether you think it is playing out with the conservative leanings in the church today. Hmm? Uh, maybe I'll start. Okay. Um, the Certainly there's a, a real issue, and it, and it saddens me. The polarization we see in our American culture is very much seen in ecclesial culture. And I think there's far too few moderate voices uh, in, in the church. Um, the folks on the real progressive left and the real traditional right tend to, tend to suck the oxygen out of the room. And, and they do what uh, John Carr mentions at Georgetown, they weaponize the crisis. So everybody comes at it from an ideological viewpoint on those two extremes. And there isn't, they don't meet in a place where there's conversation. They don't presume goodwill. 
uh, on both extremes. Um, the church is both conservative in conserving her teaching and progressive in a, being an organic institution in, in social teaching, which is to, is to transform unjust structures. So um, both of those dimensions, and, and that's where I, I favor people who are centrist and moderate, because I think they really grasp the dialectical tensions that are implicit in, in, in the Catholic faith. And so um, I, think we have to, I think we have to pray. I think we have to have forums like this where we can have dialogue. Um, I don't know if I would call the church conservative leaning. Uh, you know, Pope Francis is not thought to be, you know, a conservative pope. Um, more of the recent bishops have been, you know, maybe less conservative. So there are ebbs and flows. Uh, it's something that saddens me because uh, the, the discourse can be toxic. Um, and we need all of us. And, and one, one final thought is uh, <clears throat> a, a priest friend who was in one of the healing circles uh, that we did at his parish, at the parish where he's pastor, he's a former airline pilot. And he said that when a plane went down, they would literally look at every aspect of the crash to see exactly what happened. And he said that has not been done in these twin crises. Where is the Episcopal leadership? Uh, this is why we need laity to continue the extrinsic pressure, extrinsic to the power structure, saying we need to look at our church crisis and our culture in a systematic way, uh, preferably with somebody from the outside who can do that analysis and much like they would a plane crash, look at every facet, including those uh, the claims that traditionalists make and progressives and everybody else in between. I'm going to address it maybe at a more basic level and um, both Paul and Dan have heard me say, I think the whole world needs a circle. Um, you know, I have done a, n a number of these circles. Um, we call them healing circles or talking circles in the church and um, around clergy sex abuse, but other issues as well. And the whole trick on all of this, I said this to the law students yesterday, is to get people into that dialogue, to get them to the circle. It's not always easy. You have to do it by invitation. But the best circle is going to have people of both views, if there are two views or three views and people are conservative. I can tell you that once people start hearing each other's stories, and they come to new understanding of why it is they approach theological issues that way. You know, what about your child? Tell the story of childhood when your faith was really being formed. What was it that struck you or something about your parents? And people tell their stories and they come to new understandings. And, you know, I have seen businessmen, very conservative businessmen in a circle that I've been able to get them into actually open up in, in, in tears at times to share their stories. So, you know, whether you're doing it in a circle or you're doing it in some other format that may be more comfortable, engaging people in their own personal storytelling brings people together. And I think that that's what has to happen in the church as well with people with very different views. And I know that Dan was at a circle that we were doing in a church basement on a Saturday morning and there was an older man there who obviously um, had been a member of the Catholic faith his entire life, probably was fairly conservative, said he'd never, he'd never faced abuse or knew anybody that was abused. And then he said, I don't go to confession anymore because I don't trust them. And, and so there was still, there was that piece of his faith that's been taken away because of what's happened. And so there is that commonality, and even people that don't talk about it understand that this has really shaken the institution. Um, and so I think as much as we can promote people to listen to each other's stories um, and get people to share that in, in new ways. I know some of the people I've trained, they do it in their business meetings so that secretaries can have a voice in an office meeting and they use that talking piece. So I just encourage you, you can do that in your families. You, you know, you're having a conflict with your kids. I had a friend who um, 
had a relative die and the family was very divided and he, they conducted the small funeral gathering with a talking piece with everybody sharing a story about the deceased. And it really helped bring them together afterwards to be able to share a meal together. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that everybody can do in their everyday lives. And I think that hopefully will, will grow to a place where we can have more social dialogue at a, at a higher level. Next question, so what can people in a parish do if they have corrupt lay leaders? Well, uh, it, go on, you go, no, go, go ahead. Um, what I was gonna say is I always encourage them to use their voice to talk to someone in the parish that has some power in the parish, um, not, you know, it doesn't have to be clergy, but someone else who is willing to listen to you and someone who's wise, who may direct you in a certain direction and, and you know, address the issue that is coming. It's very difficult. I know it's a very difficult thing to do. I too want to encourage you, you know, I mean, if you think about the church, it is the people that give the clergy the power. I mean, we've given historically the power to the clergy and, and or the hierarchy. And so it is us that have to say, wait a minute, you know, we want some accountability here and we want to have a say in how things are done. And I agree with Paula, it's finding someone within the parish or another parish or in the archdiocesan offices or somewhere um, and to give voice to that and raise concerns because that's, that's how survivors who raise their voices and were willing to fight, um, that eventually we able, were able to crack open this whole um, horrible chapter in the, in the church's history. And if it hadn't been for strong voices, it wouldn't have happened. I would just add uh, one thing, which is so often when those in authority, those in leadership, uh, it could be priests, bishops, it could be laity, when they're acting in a manner that is either corrupt or deleterious to the good. You know, so in Catholic social teaching, we view authority as always authentically, if it's exercised authentically, oriented to service. And true power, according to a great German theologian, is understood as, as, as service. But oftentimes when they're acting in a manner that is not that way, it's almost always there's an unhealed wound. And so they're, they're either acting, and I'm not at all condoning it, it's, it's sad because it does great harm. And, and so that corruption comes out of some, you know, deep wound and, uh, and lack of integrity. Okay, um, thank you all for this conference. Gives us hope in dioceses where there isn't, this isn't dealt with. What is noticeable in the healing circles is an equality of participants. This is not my experience of the Catholic Church. How do we get from hierarchical church to equality, any small steps you can suggest? Well, you know, I think um, yeah, people gathering of like mind, and maybe, you know, if you're in a parish and offer a circle or a gathering of people who are interested um, and, and talk to the parish council if there's any hope, maybe have them engaged. I mean, I think bring in a speaker, um, bring in somebody who can, you know, sort of make some headway. Look to other parishes. I know that, that certainly Paula's office and, and Father Dan's work, that they, they are more than willing to share information. Um, this, the, the movie was one aspect of trying to document exactly um, where this, this archdiocese has gone. I know that when I was called in, I don't know how many years ago it was now, at that point, the survivors had not even had an opportunity to talk to the hierarchy. Um, it, was, it was pretty abysmal. Um, and all this work in part has been done because of Archbishop Hebda, who really is <coughs> been supportive of it, but even if you don't have a bishop that's supportive, 
You can find aspects of trying to bring people in. Join with another parish. There's a group in Milwaukee, and I know I think some people are watching from Milwaukee, called Awake. You may want to go to their website. That is a lay group that started um, with not a lot of archdiocese support on trying to, to promote healing and opportunities for survivors and those who have been impacted. And they've done some really, really good work. They got a great website. So um, hang in there, don't give up, um, because it's the only way the change will happen. If you go to the Awake website, make sure that you read the letter. It's one of the buttons at the top of the homepage of the Awake website. Um, and it is a letter to all victim survivors. The first time I read it, I felt like, why hasn't this come from the hierarchy to all victim survivors? It's a beautiful, beautiful letter, and I encourage you to, to read it, especially if you are a victim survivor. Um, let's see. Somebody just checked the Catholic Mobilizing Network that I had mentioned. And they have an all virtual restorative justice conference coming in October. Thought I would share for anyone else who's looking for, for more training like me. And I think that is the one that the three of us are involved in. You get to see in, us again. Too. Yeah, you that. get to see us again. <laughs> um, thank you for your endor endorsement of Catholic social teaching. I teach a CST course to high school seniors. It is very hard, and there is a lot of pushback on issues such as race, especially now. So God bless you uh, for, for doing that. Uh, one of the things we're, for teaching in that area, um, one of the things that we're doing here is we're taping a 14 part mini course. Uh, and this gives me an opportunity to, to do a shout out to Josh and Sarah. So Sarah Moon and Josh Zenner are our videographers and, and really have been doing extraordinary work uh, to get us to this point and to be able to, to give you the, the Zoom presentation. So I want to thank them along with Julie Craven. Uh, we're taping a 14-part mini course in Catholic social teaching, which I'm also uh, using for my course. And boy, do we have work to do. There's few, far too many bishops and priests who are ignorant of Catholic social teaching, Catholics who are because we haven't taught it. Uh, David Brooks, uh, who I think is a centrist, cent centrist right, the commentator who's not Catholic, says it's the one framework in our country because uh, it can be used in secular situations that can help uh, deal with complex issues. So I, I really applaud you for, for teaching that, and we really need to get the message out with regard to Catholic social teaching. Let me, let me just, for those of you who are teachers or working with youth, I'll just give you a couple of examples of how restorative justice can be used in different settings. And these were, one of them was done by one of my law students. We did a gathering of students of color and they turned out to be all male, that just the way it worked from a number of high schools. And we thought we were, we thought we were going to do a police, um, color, students of color, racial kind of circle. But we started with the, with the boys and their parents, and this is well before um, George Floyd and everything else, their parents did not want them to sit in the room with police officers and tell stories, which already was telling. So my student just had the boys do a circle and tell their stories. And they came up with this idea, to, and, and this is how long ago it was, because we had our individual little cameras, disposable cameras. They each took cameras and they went around the schools that they we're going to and they're around their community and take pictures of doors they didn't feel comfortable walking through. And they created a whole slide presentation of the doors they were uncomfortable in. And it turned out, I won't go through all the things we talked to them about, they wanted to show that to their parents. And we did a circle with their parents telling stories. So it, you, you see how you start a restorative justice project, maybe with an idea in mind, but you let the people decide how you take it and where you go with it and how you turn with it. The other circle that I did was with LGBTQ students at a Catholic high school. 
and got them to gather. And again, it was a question of whether we were going to invite other people into the circle, and they did not. Yet. They wanted to be able to share their stories with each other, and so that's the circle we did. But I, I just want to encourage you that there are lots of ways that you can work on this. It's just a matter of applying the principles of giving voice to the harm and identifying those who have been harmed, and then talk about how do you go about repairing or building for hope. And, and even with a group of like-mindedness, they can come up with projects on, on ways to, to work on things. One thing to add in terms of use of circles with regard to COVID. So we have high school students, we have middle age uh, school students, and now college students who really have suffered a lot of harm uh, in a lot of ways. I think of those, those uh, students who were seniors last year and they didn't have a senior year and now they might have gone to college uh, and they now are back online. And that is harmful. Or I think of the kids who in poverty, you know, who have, you know, they skipped the, the meals that they would normally have and or they don't have a tablet where they can partake in school. Uh, there is a lot of harm from this pandemic that restorative practices can really help heal. Um, Sarah Larson just gave a response. She is the executive director from Awake Milwaukee, and she just um, posted the, the link for the open letter in the chat room, so if you're interested, you can see it. So, thanks, Sarah. Um, Janine, at Holy Trinity in D.C., we watched a film with you that was still in production. Is it available for use for parish work? I, yes. Um, there are, in fact, we could, I don't know if they're on, the, on your website, but we can do that. There, t there are actually two circles on film. One is called the Healing Circle, and it's, I don't know, I think it may be 12 years old now, um, that, deal, that it has a circle involving four survivors of clergy abuse. It um, actually, Archbishop Dolan, who's now Cardinal Dolan, participated in it. Um, but we also had a psychologist working with priest abusers. We had one former clergy member who had abused some boys. We had another clergy member. We had some community members. We had a woman who left the church over. So that, it's an hour long film and we'll put the link on. You can use it anywhere you want. It really is meant to have people kind of a deeper understanding of the harm. There's a newer film that we've created called Torn by Trauma. And it's deal, it deals more with the trauma of, of both race and crime. And it involves some um, law enforcement officers. It involves a man who spent most of his life in prison, is in the community. It, it involves a woman whose son was a police officer killed in the line of duty and some others. And we talk about secondary trauma and people are telling really rich stories. So anyway, we'll make sure both those links go up both on, um, on the various websites, the Archdiocesan website and, and Lourdes. It's also available through Marquette University Law School who is responsible for those films. Okay. Um, is there anything being done to better teach clergy about the concept and virtue of chastity? Yeah, yes, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we still have a, a long ways to go, but I have heard encouraging stories um, from our seminary uh, and, um, and also uh, in, in uh, the Archdiocese of Houston. Uh, there's a psychologist who's gonna be doing some programming for lay ministers in our diocese. And um, I think there, the idea of really teaching the, the beauty of celibate chastity in a way that's healthy, in a way that uh, allows folks to talk about who they are, what their experiences are. The, the last thing in the world that is helpful is to not provide a forum, an opportunity uh, to deal with whatever issues people have to deal with. And, um, and so I think there is more of a, a healthy look at uh, at chastity and, and celibacy that's helpful. One of the best things that I think we can do for, for seminarians and, and clergy 
is to encourage healthy lay friendships. So yes, have priest friends. Uh, that's very important, and priest support groups. But have healthy lay friendships because that insular clerical culture, what can break through is the grounded reality that, that uh, lay people live uh, day in and day out and to, to enter into friendship. It's one of the things that has served me very well. Uh, you know, I'm not a perfect priest by any stretch, but I've been really aided by the, the robust uh, friendships that I have with, with lay friends. So, um, but in terms of education, I do think there's a better, uh, there is a better uh, approach to, uh, to chastity and to, and to celibacy that's integral, uh, that's healthy, that's informed by good, uh, good teaching. But I do think that's spotty, depending on where you are in the country, and there's, some, there's uh, room for growth as well. Well, it's a larger question, and I think also needs more, which is the whole human sexuality issue. And, and you know, um, as my um, deceased great father-in-law once said to a priest who gave a homily on family, boy, I wish I could talk that much about something I know nothing about. And uh, so I, I think that, uh, you know, it, there's a real need for that to sort of blending so that priests and other clergy can can understand what, what it's like being human and not member of the priesthood. Yeah, we had uh, somebody who preached here and referred to uh, sexual issues as pelvic issues. Uh, I can tell you the priest wasn't invited back. Uh, that lack of sensitivity, the lack of prudence, you know, um, it, there is more training to be done with regard to priest, priests and in seminary with regard to social skills, the virtue of prudence, uh, knowing time and place, and, and uh, you know, so w we have a lot to learn and a lot to, lot to implement in that regard. Um, the collective wisdom of this panel is so very appreciated. It would be most helpful for there to be training on how to listen. Many lay leaders and members of parishes are inundated with stories of harm, damage, and pain. And being taught how to listen is a key component to being able to respond. One of the, experience, the experiences that I have had every time I've been in a circle experience is that it forces people to listen in a, in, a, in a kind, gentle way. Because you have the talking piece, you're passing it from person to person. One person speaks at a time. There's no crosstalk, which drives me crazy, in, a, in a, um, a setting like that, that we try to fix each other when we have so much work to do on ourselves. So I have found that in, in my experience with circles. Um, I'll tell another story. One of the circles I've done is actually at the seminary up here um, with seminarians. And um, I, I showed them the film um, and um, I, uh, we gathered and they were using the talking piece. And so then afterwards they were doing an evaluation of the experience. And one of, one of the seminarians said, well, that was really interesting. And I said, really? And he said, you know, he said, when people started talking, I just thought of all the questions I wanted to ask them and all the information he said. And by the time it got back to me, I settled down and he said, you know, I actually felt differently inside that I was actually listening. And I said, you know, this whole circle was worth just that moment for you to understand the importance of not talking and listening. Um, so it's exactly, you know, I think, I agree with that, you know, they're listening skill activities, but the circle forces you while you're listening to real stories. Sarah Larson from Awake Milwaukee just posted a link um, on how to learn to listen. Listening, thank you, Sarah. yeah, thanks Sarah. Listening to um, Catholics need to hear survival stories and five ways to listen to them. So that would be good, I think. Um, the one thing that I would like to, <clears throat> to say is that we're also offering in our archdiocese once a month a presentation on Zoom for victim survivors and anyone else who wants to attend. 
I can see that some people on this have been to those meetings, um, those uh, presentations. We had our first one in August, and it was on shame. The next one we're doing uh, at the end of September, and it is on trauma. In October, we're doing how to heal from institutional abuse. And the fourth one in November, we're doing on grooming. So um, that might be of interest to some people. But I'd like to wrap up right now with just a, a meditation to read. And I just ask everyone to just close your eyes and just listen. This is from Henry Nouwen. The spiritual life starts at the place where you can hear God's voice, where somehow you can claim that long before your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your school, your church touched you, loved you, and wounded you. Long before that, you were held safe in an eternal embrace. You were seen with eyes of perfect love long before you entered into the dark valley of life. The spiritual life starts at the moment that you can go beyond all of the wounds and claim that there was a love that was perfect and unlimited. Long before that perfect love became reflected in the imperfect and limited conditional love of people. The spiritual life starts when you dare to claim that first love. Thank you.